Hey, welcome to the Sequential Artist Workshop Pro Calls. Every week we ask another creator, another graphic novelist to come sit down with us and tell us um, where they came from. What were the first things they made? What did they make recently? How did they do it? <laughs> what are they thinking about now? How are they going to move forward? How do they keep going? All those things, career things, art things, feeling things, creative things. Every month it's a new creator, new challenges, new stories. Come check it out. Come sit down with us. You can sit down live for some of these calls by being a member of our groups. You can find us at learn.sawcomics.org. Come check it out. Come be a graphic novelist with us. Come join us on the socials. Sometimes it's Comics Workshop, sometimes it's Saw Comics. Either way, come check us out and welcome. Do, do, do. Yay! Hey, Wait. there you are. Hello. <laughs> hey, Carl. How's it going? Oh, not so bad. It's a beautiful day for it out here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yay. Very cool. All right. And we usually do questions at the end, and we just let um, Carl kind of take take us on the road <laughs> and show us the sites and then um and and the calls usually last about an hour or so but there's no pressure some some people like to talk and some people wish to not speak for quite as long an hour well, seems like a you long. you don't know this about me yet most of you but i i there's very few things that I like the sound of more than my own voice oh, um good. so i will be i'm just gonna like just point me in a direction i'll go okay. um so and this I've is got... a delightful hostage situation. If anyone's like, my Wi-Fi is being weird. And uh, uh -huh, okay, I get you. <laughs> yeah, blink twice if you're being held hostage. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I've got, like, uh, I have a short, um, like, it's about, it's 45 slides. So that's pretty short for, for comics. Yeah. Um, I have a, a little slideshow that I can show you guys that has uh, some examples of my earlier work. Uh, and then after that, um, what I'll probably do is just sort of get into the way that I've started working now um, and uh, some of the other stuff that that is going on here. That rocks. That's so good. And something I always forget to do and I forgot to do on Friday when we had our Friday Night Comics is talk about um, our guest in the third person in front of them. Do you mind if I do that, Carl? Could I do that? Oh, no, go for it. Love I'm going to practice saying your last name. That's so beautiful. And ends in a Z. Carl Antonowitz. That's there. correct. Oh, mm -hmm. nailed it. He's yeah. a cartoonist. I, I think your pronouns are he, but let me know if they're not. Um, that's correct. Okay, cool. So, oh man, I'm nailing it. Oh, let's get out of here before I ruin it. Okay, so <laughs> Carl's a cartoonist, which you might know. He's also a writer, a performer, a promoter, and a musician working in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the United States. He has self-published zines, graphic novels, and mini comics since 2005. He earned his master's in cartooning from the Center for Cartoon Studies in 2011. I might have met you there, maybe. Um, he teaches at Lesley University and the University of Tulsa, as well as a number of other institutions. The Ardent is his first graphic novel with a publisher, and it's due out late this year. Oh, my gosh. Learn more about Carl at his website, and I'll paste that into the chat. It's cantocomics.com or on Instagram canto comics with an x slightly different so i'm going to uh, paste that into the zoom chat all right <laughs> sound good did i do it did i yeah, get all that true <laughs> all of that is 100 gospel awesome okay cool. um okay so hello uh my name is carl antonowitz and i'm a cartoonist among other things um if you would allow me uh just to share my screen Okay, try it again now. I, I think it's ready. There we go. Share. Let's do the slideshow. All right, cool. So, hello. This this is my name. This is how you spell it. Uh, it's got almost every letter. Uh, we're only short by like 12, actually. Um, so, I'm a cartoonist, among other things. Um, for the past decade or so, I have been working on a series of loosely connected narratives called The Rude Lands. Um, this isn't like a massive crossover event kind of thing. I find those to be incredibly tedious, um, where readers need to have like consumed a massive backlog in materi of material in order to understand the new book, but rather a grouping of stories set in the same world. They sort of like, they're like uh, windows facing the same courtyard. Um, they are also sort of grouped together by similar concerns and themes. Um, I, I was told not too long ago by Rob Clough that like I have this really anti-authoritarian bent in my narratives, which like 
I didn't realize, but is totally true. Um, <laughs> there are, as of this talk, three self-published graphic novels and two mini comics in the series, including The Pestle, uh, which I released in 2014 or 15 um, as a uh, hand-bound book with a book ribbon, wax seal, uh, and hand-done calligraphy uh, on each book. There were about 150 of these ever made. Um, each book needed to be side-stapled, folded, glued, face-trimmed, folded again, written on, and then sealed. Uh, and then, like a total idiot, I was selling these for like 20 bucks uh, at conventions. Which, even back then, um, uh, un undervaluing my labor. Um, I stopped making them in 2018 because they were so complex to produce and didn't make me enough per unit to be sustainable. If I were to produce anything like this again, I would set the price point a lot higher, or else make significantly fewer copies. Or maybe both. I don't know. Um, the Pestle was inspired by two things. The culture of economic privilege and uh, exclusivity at a certain college in New Hampshire. This is um, uh, Dartmouth, uh, which is right across the river from White River Junction, where um, where uh, the Center for Cartoon Studies is. Um, crap. Um, and then also the uh, the first medical school in all of Christendom. Uh, which was the Medical School of Salerno, which is located in uh, southern Italy, I think Sicily, actually. Um, I first learned about the medical, medical School of Salerno uh, from the most excellent medical historian, Roy Porter's book, Flesh in the Age of Reason, which concerns itself primarily with the intellectual history of the body and the Scottish Enlightenment. And I learned about Flesh in the Age of Reason uh, through the experimental composer Ben Frost, wonderful movement score FAR, which is a piece for vocals, samples, and extremely distorted instruments. Um, both of these I can recommend very, very highly. Like the Flesh in the Age of Reason is something that I like keep coming back to and keep like thinking about things that are going, that like Porter talks about in it. Uh, and then FAR, uh, not really on heavy rotation for me right now, but uh, Frost work is something that I always come back to. Um, so there's two viewpoint characters here. Um, this is Artemisia de Pregio, uh, who is from somewhere vaguely south uh, from where this uh, story takes place. Uh, and she's also a medical student, uh, med medical school student uh, at the titular medical school, the Pestle. Uh, and Tom Carter, who's a drunken sot and native of the town surrounding the Pestle. Um, so this like super high contrast black and white art is really striking, right? Uh, but it does do uh, do me kind of a disservice because it highlights a lot of my kind of wonky anatomy from my drawing at this pay at this stage, uh, which has improved considerably. But uh, you know, and this, there's a reason this book's out of print. Um, so. Yeah, I was trying to imitate uh, Mike Mignola and Guy Davis, both of whom use extremely heavy spot blacks. Like for Mignola, that's how you know it's a Mignola. Mignola does Hellboy. Uh, Guy Davis mostly does creature designs at this point for Hollywood. Hollywood motion pictures! Uh, but he was also the lead artist on BPRD for a long time, Sandman Mystery Theater, uh, the most excellent series, The Marquee, um and oh just a number of other things baker street was uh, another one of his early ones um and so yeah i i kept trying to ape those uh strong spot blacks and seemingly static compositions uh through until the blood runs black which is a, a piece that occurred in between or a piece that i did in between the pestle and what i'm about to talk to you about um i really abandoned that style almost altogether on term ring um Term ring, which is a German word meaning tower ring or ring of towers, is another Rudeland story about, among other things, class, gender, adultery, and the limits of caregiving. It's real light fare, uh, an extremely cheerful beach read. Um, all of these stories, just really great at parties, definitely not standing in the corner next to, like, Tom York and just, like, spitting on the ground or whatever. Um, the story and setting for this book were inspired by the pre-modern theory of infection called miasma theory, put forth first by Hippocrates in the 4th century BCE, uh, which held that bad or corrupted air was responsible for spreading disease. In term ring, this idea manifests as a caustic fog that kills all the menfolk in your titular village. Um... Uh, there are nuns who are sort of walled up in these, um, you can't quite see it here, but it's this little, like, tower thing uh, that ring the village, and there's this magic wall that they hold up by basically singing and chanting, 
uh, 24 seven. And when one voice fails, another voice from a different tower sort of picks up the slack. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, I first heard about Anchor Assist's, uh through this band of Sequii. Um, <laughs> Jess, I'm glad I'm glad you're a big fun, a uh, big fan of nuns. I love I love the love religious. Um, anyway, yeah. So um, I first heard about this because of this band of Sequii. Good lord, why is this happening like this? Okay, there we go. A CPI is like a medieval black metal band. They use like medieval scales, um, and I think there's somebody playing a um, a lute or a harpsichord or uh, one of the or like a guitar that's been tuned to like a medieval um, scale. Um, yeah, so they uh, there's a track on this album which is Aria of Vernal Tombs. Um, one of the tracks is called Anchorus's Orison, and I did not know uh, what either of those words meant. So I looked it up, uh, and that sort of led me down a rabbit hole. Um, I ended up buying a copy of this book called Ankrin Visa, which is a guidebook for, for Anchorus's, uh, uh, written like around the time, like 12th century or so, when, these, mm -hmm. when this practice was very popular. Um, and an orison, by the way, is a prayer, if you might know this already. Um, so, yeah, um, an observant audience member may have observed a distinct lack of panel borders on Termering. Um, I specifically chose not to draw these borders so that when I did choose to include them, they would stand to separate moments compositionally from their surrounding panels, creating a sense of isolation and claustrophobia. Um, I chose to eschew those heavy spot blacks, uh, the that I was using prior um, in order to just like give this a little bit more of an airy feel and to sort of like, I don't know, break up the monotony of doing everything with incredibly heavy spot blacks. Um, these do read a little bit better on a screen, but sometimes like in this moment here, things are a little bit muddy uh, because there's not like, there's not as distinct a separation. Um, I do something similar to this in the Argent, but I'll uh, I'll get to that later. Um, so Turmering was originally meant to be around six saddle stitched, six single saddle stitched issues of around 25 to 30 pages each. Uh, but I took a break from it for a couple of years and that presentation method ceased to make sense because there was, you know, like a global pandemic that was going on. So it just, why would I make these little things when I'm not going to be at a convention where I can like trade for them or whatever? Um, so yeah, I ended up finishing this in 2021. This is what the compiled book looks like. Um, this is still in print. Um, you can find this at my uh, <laughs> at my web store if you're interested in such a thing. I can drop a link to that later on. Chris Seidel, uh, a man up in Kansas City, uh, already did his research. Hey, it showed up. Awesome, dude. Love it. Um, so yeah, those... Um, yeah, so I, I got those printed through Bookmobile um, a couple a couple of years ago uh, with some assistance from the financial or from some financial assistance from the Tulsa Artists Fellowship. Um, when these were released, I did a uh, like an evening long performance of that other book that I mentioned before, "Until the Blood Runs Black," also out of print, um, which uh, like I sort of adapted so that I'd be able to perform it on my own and do sound effects and all the voices for it about which more shortly. Um, so since the public, this is until the blood runs black behind me here, and that's that's me as a skinnier man. Um, since the publication of Until the Blood Runs Black in 2015, I had been doing periodic comics readings of that and other pieces. Um, I, as you can possibly tell, have a natural performative bent um, and a uh, background in high school theater. So adapting these comic stories for an audience was kind of a no brainer that I didn't really even take seriously uh, until 2018 when I got a grant for it. Um, so there are not, unfortunately, as you're very likely aware, a huge number of grant opportunities to wear for people working in our medium. Um, the media may have scored a narrow victory over its detractors and that is now widely considered an art form, uh, but still a long way to go before comics are regarded with the same respect as a novel, painting, or even the lowly poem. Um, we we don't we don't get shit from the academy. That's just kind of the way it works. 
uh, and that sucks, and maybe it'll be different at some point in the future, but I'm not holding my breath, and so we have to make the inroads uh, as best we can. Um, so anyway, I applied to the New Hazlet Theatre's Community Supported Arts Grant with a kind of far-fetched idea about performing this graphic novel about leprosy. Uh, much to my surprise, I got in. Um, I was able to use the New Hazlet's amazing space and technical resources to elevate what I've been doing in my live readings at, like, cafes. Um, if any of you have ever been to, say, uh, Space, that uh, convention out in Columbus, uh, it's great, Bob Corby, a major asset um, to every community in these United States. Um, and, like, they also always would host these uh these readings at Cafe Kerouac, which is not super far away from the venue. And uh, that's actually where I first saw uh, uh, Tom read. Um, he read from Rosalie Lightning, and that was actually like a really eye-opening experience for me, like watching him like feel those feelings again on stage. Oh, it's just fucking gutting. Uh, and so that like sort of gave me this idea to like elevate this a little bit more there are other like large-scale comics performance things like oh i don't know intergalactic nemesis is one of them uh and there's probably something else too but uh intergalactic nemesis is very nostalgia based and um i don't want to like i don't want to shit on them by like describing them in a bad way but like they're uh it feels very very much like star wars like where it's it's based on these older things um and like there's a lot of references to radio theater in it um which feel kind of retrogressive to me um and again no shade on them honestly but like i uh i just thought that there could be something more done with this um intergalactic nemesis is <laughs> so jazz intergalactic nemesis is a comic performance group uh so all of those. You're welcome. <laughs> oh yeah, Zine's not dead. Rules. I've not actually seen them uh, yet, but I know that they. I know that they exist, and I got a chance to talk to them at Cake last year. Um, so anyway, yeah, I was able to use the New Hazlet's resources in order to build this show. Um, I was able to hire some other voice actors. Uh, in the center there is my friend Joanna. This is Ryan Haggerty over here. Uh, not pictured in this shot is yours truly. Um, I was able to hire a sound designer to sort of help me work out ideas about sound effects and like build Foley props and things like that, which is not a thing I'd ever really thought about. I figured I was just going to like trigger everything off of, um, uh, off of a sampler that I happen to have. Um, yeah. And like, this was all kind of a difficult learning process as like I had directed a short play of my own device in high school theater I'd done like nothing theatrically since then aside from burlesque and slam poetry um but like I don't do either of those anymore and by this point it had been probably over a decade since I'd done a slam poem which is probably for the best um I do have uh 10 minutes of the first 10 minutes of this good lord okay yeah so there's the first 10 minutes of this that are, uh, the, the whole recording of this show is up on YouTube. Um, I'll, um, just drop the, um, drop that in the chat. Uh, kind of them. Bitte schön. Um, so there's that. Um, and then I also, no, 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 no. <clears throat> Stop. Okay, so um, I applied for and received a supplemental grant from the Heinz Small Arts Initiative, which ended up quadrupling the budget for the show, which I was able to hire more technicians and pay everybody a little bit better. Um, I also used some of those monies, about like four or five hundred dollars, I think, to print um, uh, copies of the first half of the book. Um, this is the first 55 or so pages of Boyer's Kiss, which are all that were completed at that, that time, because I was like... While I was putting the show together, I was also drawing everything in it, uh, inking it, scanning it, uh, doing the letters, cutting up each each page um, into individual slides, and then sending them off to um, this video editor that I had hired uh, so he could build a show in this software called QLab, um, which I can't run because it's a, it's a Mac-only thing. Anyway, um, so, like... 
these pages are enormous. They're like 14 by 17. It's a 12 panel grid that I sort of like fuse and flex a little bit. Um, and like the idea was that I would draw less if I were doing a lot of panels per page, but that's clearly not what happened. Uh, um, and like, uh, again, like if you look at any of the reviews that Rob Clow has posted of, of my work over the course of the past 10, 15 years, um, <laughs> he identifies every single time this tendency that I have to over render things. Um, and like, it's just, a, it's sort of a horror vacuity thing that I have only just recently gotten control of. Um, anyway, so this large panel count and the um, often pretty intense uh, depictions of leprous bodies have been known to uh, put known to force readers to put this uh, put this book down uh, in the middle of it. And for like 114 pages, I feel pretty good about that, all things considered. Um, it's also like it's kind of funny, which is a thing that uh, was new to me at the time. Uh, it's very like it's body humor based, so it's like lowest common denominator in that regard. But like, I don't know if you can't laugh at somebody else's farts, then then what are you doing? If you can't laugh at your own farts, even. Shit. Um, <laughs> anyway, so during the pandemic, um, I again used some Tulsa Artist Fellowship money uh, to compile these into this book, um, which is the completed boy's kiss. There's like photos and stuff in the back of it. Uh, I'm not necessarily trying to sell this to you, but if you'd like to buy a copy, you know where to find it. Um, <laughs> yeah, Chris has got it. Good on you, man. Um, so yeah, we performed this show at three different locations in uh, Pittsburgh and Ohio. Um, I was living in Pittsburgh at the time, perhaps obviously. Um, and I don't know, I'm, I'm very, very thankful to everybody who worked with me on this. This is like 2018 and I'm still like, I still feel very proud of this and like am kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of, um, I, don't know. I still think this is like maybe maybe one of my crowning achievements. Um, and also it happened early, you know, like I I mean, I was like 30. Something, I don't really know um, when this happened and it felt like it was going to be this huge, huge thing. Right. Uh, and then uh, that same year, the same year that we did this, my, my wife and I got married um, and then uh, we. Uh, and then, and then my wife got the Tulsa Artist Fellowship, and so we, <laughs> whatever inroads I had built into the theater community in uh, <laughs> in Tulsa or in in Pittsburgh ceased to mean anything because we moved out west. And then <laughs> we moved out west the next year, and then you know what happened in 2020. Um, so like that was all just sort of put on pause. Um, yeah, all of this like. Again, I feel really, really good about this still, uh, and I will drop a shorter version of that link. Um, so during the pandemic, I started working on The Ardent, um, which is a new book. It's designed specifically to be a hybrid graphic novel, one-man performance. Uh, it's been my main focus for comics for the last three years or so. Um, I took a bit of a different approach to this project, having learned from Boris Kiss that rushing to complete massive pages with obscene numbers of panels uh, would make me kind of crazy. Um, so I took my time and worked smaller. The Ardent's pages are all about 9 by 12, a uh, typical panel count of four or fewer. Um, I tried to give this story a little, little bit more space, too, uh, rather than rushing breathlessly from scene to scene. Um, there are lots of quiet, introspective moments like this, uh, where the main character, Odolf, and his donkey are just sort of like walking through this blue landscape. Um, so the story of the Ardent uh, is informed by the Counter-Reformation Catacomb Saints, a not widely known practice where generations of monks and nuns would attach jewels and gold to the bones of supposedly martyred saints. Um, these saints were discovered in a single catacomb underneath Rome uh, in like 16, 17 something. Um, and uh, they were excavated, they were like identified to be Christian bones. Uh, and then were shipped off to the Low Countries, uh, where where the Reformation was really happening. Like Martin Luther, or whatever was doing was doing his thing there, and so all of these folks are sort of being like, no, 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 Catholicism is still cool. Come on, 
look, we got these jeweled skeletons, um, which it worked out pretty well. Like this, it's a real eye catching thing. Um, and they would like parade these around on feast days. Um, yeah, so this is this is a real thing. Um, like this, this actually happened. Uh, my friend Lindsay went and saw Saint Munditia, who uh, the saint who is in the Arden is based loosely on um, her and uh, Saint uh, Saint Ursula. Uh, um, anyway, so yeah, the story is about this monk Odolf, who is uh, transporting this jeweled skeleton, who's the patron saint of his order, cross country. On the way, he meets a bunch of people who tell him stories that make him start to question his faith a little bit. Um, as a stage show. This piece runs precisely 58 minutes and 22 seconds. Um, I do all 13 human voices and the donkey. I make all the sound effects with an array of household objects and about 18 pre-recorded cues on a Roland SP-404 sampler. Um, and there it is. Um, I pitched this book to a few publishers in April or May of last year after finishing what I thought was the last page. Uh, I'd never sent a book out to a publisher since, like, 2008. Um, so this was, like, uh, a totally different thing for me. Um, I've seen, like, enough friends get burned on bad deals or have their book get stuck in editorial limbo for years. Um, or, like, see people, like, work for five years on a book and then the publisher just, like, not not doing anything for them, you know? Like, oh, okay, cool. So you worked on this book for a while. I guess we'll print it. That's it. You're on your own. Um, and I just I just didn't want to deal with them, which is why, like, all of my stuff up to this point has been pretty much self-published. Um, and, like, I don't have any... I don't think there's, there's anything wrong with working with the publisher, obviously. Uh, and working with Fieldmouse, who is going to put this out, is a dream come true, for sure. Uh, but, like, it is something that I'm it's something that I'm leery of and I do encourage uh, students when I'm teaching them to also, you know, cover your ass uh, when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, but also, so the ardent is obviously in color uh, and I'd very much like to be able to afford a large run of a full colored hardcover book, but I can't. Um, and I thought about kickstarting the thing too, but I don't think I have that same kind of reach that, that like a publisher's publisher would would be able to to give me um so i was shocked and aghast and overjoyed um uh here in june of this year or last year that the ardent would be published in 2024 by field mouse press um i was also blessed with the opportunity to premiere the show this september or this past september at the small press expo in beautiful bethesda maryland um ironically one of the largest conventions on the east coast indie comics circuit um, so historically, when I've done these live readings, I've had somebody else there to advance the slides for me while I'm performing, or else had a spare hand to trigger them myself. Um, for the Ardent, though, uh, my hands are busy probably 80 to 90% of the time, um, either manipulating fully objects, some of which you can see here, uh, triggering pre-recorded sounds on this sampler. There's this bell that goes off a couple of times. This is a box of rocks. Uh, this has potatoes in it. Um, there is a tomato back here, which does not survive the performance. Um, I think this uh, V-neck uh, does actually have some pretty substantial tomato stains on it to this very day. Um, yeah, so also sometimes I'm just like emoting. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of stuff doing that. Um, my lovely and extremely patient wife, Sophie Goldstein, was meant to accompany to this convention, uh, but uh, she had a last minute work thing come up and so she had to stay home. Um, ended up spending about 36 hours inputting timings for the show, which is which is like 600 something panels uh, and rehearsing before getting on the plane to DC. Uh, like I said, this show is 58 minutes, 22 seconds, which is a marathon for a comics reading, especially a solo one. Uh, but it was extremely tight. The convention had booked another panel in the same space directly following my following mine. Uh, so I had to strike the whole setup off stage in less than two minutes uh, and continue breaking down my setup and uh, stowing it in a suitcase in a staging area off the side of the space. Uh, I was covered in tomato pulp um, for making the sound of a uh, eye being sliced out. Um, 
So yeah, that's the Ardent. Um, that's like only one of the like the comics thing is just one part of my practice. I do a number of other things. Um, I record and perform weird music adjacent sounds. Uh, solo as open casket sound system uh, remains to be seen. Over here is the most recent release of that that came out on tape this January. It looks like this. Uh, I've got another run of these coming out uh, pretty soon. Um, the first run of 50 I am out of, uh, which is just bizarre. Uh, I mean, it's tape, right? Who buys tapes? Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I had started making sounds uh, in the early 2000s, I think probably when I was still in high school. Um, I still don't know much, if anything, about uh like music theory or anything like that um but i was building this uh building songs as guilty as sin for a few years like till 20 2005 or so um on uh cool edit which is now a part of whatever the adobe suite thing of that is uh whatever the adobe suite version of a uh, uh waveform editing is uh this was like this was the second album i put out as guilty as sin um, I released it as like five CDRs. Um, I'll drop a, a link to the uh, to the Bandcamp on here if you want to look at this more closely. Um, it's it's cringe. Um, there's titles like Paris Hilton is a skank, Barbara Bush is a bitch. I know, right? Um, which Paris Hilton? Sure, whatever. Barbara Bush. This is actually true, but I don't I didn't need a shit on her. I just thought this was like I don't know. I don't know what I was gonna call the thing before. Um, anyway, there's like five, five packages that looked like this. Um, uh, and again, it's 2005. I'm not super proud of it anymore. Um, anyway, I didn't think I was going to do that ever again, but then you know what happened 15 years later, it was a global pandemic once again, and we were getting stimmy checks in the mail from, uh, from uncle Don. Um, so what else is a dude in his mid thirties? gonna do but buy a bunch of guitar pedals uh so i started buying guitar pedals um and uh just let's see what see what happens here um uh, i played some of my tracks for nathan young who used to run this organization called tulsa noise here in town as well as the excellent micro label peyote tapes uh this um thing that's on screen that i have in my hand here is the first uh like official release as open casket sound system um it's a series of improvisations for amplified get amplified uh garbage can lid uh and uh, an array of pedals um tape is back baby uh it's mostly a concept album about the beast of armageddon uh which in this in this instance takes place takes the form of a kaiju that plods aimlessly in a post-environmental collapse wasteland trailed by throngs of ecstatic debased supplicants um so nathan was like hey man you do you do comics so you you've got to make a comic for this and i was like nathan i don't i don't wanna comics are really hard and this was really easy in comparison this was just improv i spent about as long making these pieces as it takes you to listen to them um uh, but whatever i had 60 hours to burn so i did a little i did a little zine which is that guy in the center there um that is uh i started so this was a run of like 25 cassettes uh so because i didn't want to like let this wait let this work just like relish languish languish uh for for the rest of eternity um i decided to print out the zine and put like Here's where you screen cap. Put this little QR code on, on here. Um, you can also listen to this on Bandcamp if you would uh, like to do such a thing. But you are, of course, under no obligation to do so. Um, so then, late 2021, I composed the really slow, big, cavernous beat and left it on my looper, which, which the looper I was using could only hold one pattern at a time. And so if I was to record over this, I would just lose it forever. Um, and I just improvised over it once or twice a week for about six months. Um, the seven best recordings out of that period, uh, became Tomb Riddim, uh, which like, <laughs> again, I was like, I don't know if I want to do a zine for this. Uh, but then Brad, the guy who runs, uh, Foxy Digitalis, the label, uh, that, uh, on, out on which this originally came 
was like, you should probably do a comic. And I was like, damn, <laughs> damn it, Brad, fine. Um, so there, there you have it. That's also up on Bandcamp. Brad has the uh, uh, the zines for that. Um, if you run into me at a show, I will probably have copies of it too. Um, but actually, I was in uh, in Gainesville at Saw doing a residency when I started drawing what would become this zine, which is like uh, a, a number of incarnations. Like it sort of builds on this idea of a rhythm, which is like a reused instrumental track um, from usually reggae uh, that folks would like get uh, like a cheap pressing of and then sort of record their own vocal chatter on top of it. Um, well, that's, that's, that's this. Um, anyway, the, uh, the noise experimental sound art community is raisingly receptive to all manner of weird stuff. And I made significant inroads. I made a lot of good friends through doing this stuff. Um, and I decided to give back last year uh, and let some other folks take the spotlight. Um, so I started this thing called One Offs, which is a monthly open mic night for the Sonically Curious. Uh, that is on Instagram at one dot ox. Uh, that's O N E, period A U X. Uh, um, and this is just a Tulsa thing for right now, but we have friends in other places, and we're, we've started like branching out and booking booking traveling acts and things like that around this area. Uh, we've got next month we have like a harsh noise thing on the 11th we have our first anniversary on the 10th the night directly before we have an ambient showcase uh on the 17th and then on the 25th we have a show uh down in norman which is like an hour and a half away from us which is just uh my performance partner todd and myself um but like you don't have to be doing anything weird in order to do this uh, in order to play at one ox like we've had singer songwriter types we've had um like moody house music type people. We had a couple of junglists um, and so on and so forth. Uh, we try to provide a, a, a recording of every set um, to the um, to the performers. Uh, some of them have even released these on their own. Uh, this is the Black Star Experience, which is uh, Dakota Harrington. Um, and this is a picture of his pedal board uh, from the night that this recording uh, was uh, 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 captured. Anyway, yeah, if you look around a little bit for these, you'll be able to find them. Um, the plan with the with One Ox is to make a mini label where we release stuff from our favorites. Uh, but the main point is, did the monthly night where we give a chance to perform to uh, creative sound folks who might not otherwise have one, sort of a launching pad um, for um, for indie musicians, you know. And like, there is not a large and active comic scene in Tulsa, unfortunately. I know only maybe two or three other local creators, uh, and and that sucks. But hopefully, with um, more people coming into town and more people uh, getting interested in the idea of making comics and like the, the amount of evangelism that I do on the ground about, uh, about comics and how important they are as a medium, um, hopefully that is going to uh going to change pretty soon uh that's the end of the slideshow part of this um you've seen these if you do want to email me at some point it's cantocomics at gmail.com you are more than welcome to i i do strive to be uh as gracious as possible um <laughs> but it may take me a minute to get back to you because as you may or may not have noticed uh i am a pretty busy dude <laughs> slow and gracious yeah um, <laughs> so that was not like that was a, a, more of a, a lecture for like a general audience um uh but i can show you some stuff about what i've been working on recently um so like one of the things that that is very, damn it, not this, um, is, is important to me in my practice is like having a, um, shoot, hold on, uh, is having like, is just making time, you know, like the, um, one thing that I've learned about, um, 
about being alive in the world is that it doesn't give you space um, to create. It's not that's not important to the world at large, right? It's important to you. This is what feeds us. This is what makes us get up in the morning. Um, so you have to steal that time because it's not it's not promised. Um, so the way this ends up working for me is that first thing in the morning, I put on a pot of coffee and then I'll like sit down on the couch and I'll basically start free writing. Um, and like the free writing thing comes from, um, comes from research, comes from reading, uh, like nonfiction books and that kind of thing. Um, the project that I'm working on, one of the projects that I'm working on right now is this thing called, um, tendrils of the divine which is another rude land story um and it's about these uh these two brothers one of whom is uh the seventh son of a seventh son the other the other of whom is like a the third or fourth son of a seventh son which means he's just some schmuck um so like i don't know how familiar you are with like <laughs> european mythology about about this sort of thing but seventh sons of seventh sons are almost always something special uh, and it sort of varies depending on where you're where you're getting your myths from. But for this, I'm building off of this uh, myth complex uh, called Saludadorith or uh, or cunning men uh, in other areas of uh, of Europe. Um, I chose to set this in Spain because I find the the uh, environment of medieval Spain right up until 1492 to be extremely interesting because there's this concept called conviviencia where like all of the the three peoples of the book who are in that area are all sort of living and working together it's like not an easy piece but it is like one that is somewhat enforced um yeah anyway so yeah i'm, I'm writing about these faith healers in um in the Iberian Peninsula, um, and faith these particular this particular myth of faith healers have um, the ability to like cure rabies, for example, with their mouth. Uh, they have the ability to like cure a bunch of different diseases by kissing people, spitting on them, or like sucking poison out. Um, so you know, I just sort of like I hit the page with that, and I just sort of start running, and like a lot of this, um, I don't know how well. Okay, cool. Um, so like. A lot of this sounds like a conversation with myself. So anyway, the next morning, the boys are out on the road again, trailed by their pack animal, whose name might be Rosa? Rosita? Rosa is burdened with the tent and the other food provisions, uh, cookware, a few provisions, a satchel of amulets, perhaps. Beto seems fine, despite his full evening of sulking. He went to bed before Compline. Manu looks a little worse for wear as he stumbled back to the tent. Only an hour or two before Terce. He's unshaven, more than normal. If he has facial hair, let's do some sketches of the boys this week. Huh? Um... And then this is like, I think I wrote this in like October of last year and didn't actually get around to doing those character sketches until January. But I take like an hour, maybe an hour and a half to to just like fly at this. Um, and the first like, I'm not doing this on anything special. This is just like a like a regular ass, uh, like $1 college ruled notebook. I do, I do prefer the college ruled to the wide ruled. Um, just like because you can fit more on the page, you know? Um, and, like, my handwriting is not the neatest, but it is, like, in all caps. So, like, even if I am, like, really goofy one morning, um, I, I will probably be able to distinguish what I'm saying. Um, so, yeah, just free write for the first couple of months there. Um, and then I sort of moved into doing um, thumbnails and more more structured scripting um so like i'm writing notes to see to tell myself what's happening in each panel in case i can't read my thumbnails like these are oh like maybe three inches tall something like that uh and i tend to do them straight straight to ink uh at this stage um and so like this is draft one uh so like usually when i'm working on a book i'll try to get all of draft one written out uh, by hand and then transcribe at a later point. Uh, and I don't usually get um, much by way of feedback until that point. Um, these are notes from my wife over here. Uh, my wife is like a really, a really excellent editor um, and does not stand around for my shit. So like, 
<laughs> so like she she's kind of a tough reader, but she's also like the um she's also very observant in in a way that like very few people have ever taken the time uh to do for my work. And it I mean get you somebody who is willing to do a line by line on uh uh on a draft um if at all possible. It's really, really wonderful. Um she's also a cartoonist, Sophie Goldstein, um multiple Ignatz Award winner, uh, multiple Polish graphic novelists. Has that created tension in the past? Yes, absolutely. Um, but I don't want to talk about it. Anyway, so like then like I'll type it up and I'll refine it a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll type up the script that I had written and I'll refine it slightly. Uh, and then I'll do another round of thumbnails, usually on uh, the same page. And like I'll be looking at the previous round of thumbnails and being like, how could I make this gooder? How can I like fix the reading flow problem that I had on this particular page? Um, and so I'll just, yeah, I'll just fix that. And then I don't bother showing the thumbnails to anybody. Who cares? Um, and then I'll go into pencils and then thence to inks. Uh, but in between there, in between the first draft and the uh, the typing up, I usually do these sort of free form um, character pages. And this is our this is our main guy from Tendrils of the Divine. Uh, Beto. Uh, and Beto has uh, a saint living in his mouth um, who just, like, comes out and, like, eats diseases. Um, he does have to, like, in the first chapter, he, like, has to suck rabies out of this, uh, out of this woman's dad's face. Uh, um, and he just hates it. It's a really gross story. I'm gonna have a lot of fun drawing it. Um, and uh, not for the faint of stomach, I don't think. Watch for that uh, <laughs> at conventions later this year. I'll also probably be posting it on my Patreon uh, for them's what's interested in doing that. Um, so yeah, like I, I'll just sort of draw draw the characters in different positions, making different faces. Um, <laughs> I drew this during a teaching residency, so you can sort of see um, <laughs> you can see some of the. Uh, uh, notes that I've notes that I'm taking while somebody else is talking, uh, like, uh, so my my friend Pam Petra was talking about this concept called hiraith, uh, which is a a Welsh thing for meaning belonging, uh, something missing in the present moment, love that remains after a relationship is over, um, and I observe that Welsh just sort of looks like keyboard mashing. And I'm not like I'm not trying to shit on Welsh or anything. I think it's I think it's a beautiful language, but like that's a lot of whys. Um <coughs> Yeah, and then like I'll I do pencils and inks, analog. Um I do as little as possible uh on the computer because I I I really distrust it for a lot of things. And I know that this is like it's extremely stupid of me to like want to go as analog as this. Um, it's just one of those things where like, I don't know. I, I grew up with kind of unreliable technology. Uh, I am 38 or nine years of age now. Um, and the, I don't know, like doing things on the computer just didn't seem like it was going to be possible for me and I still like I just grew to distrust them more and more and now the more uh the smarter the computers have become the less I trust them so you know it's a vicious cycle uh this is a page from the ardent um there are obviously no pages for um uh for tendrils of the divine just yet I'm still in writing phases I think I'm through the third or fourth chapter of what's probably going to be um uh, probably going to be around eight. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think you guys are probably done listening to me, <laughs> listening to me ramble here. Um, how can I stop sharing? There it goes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Do you have any questions about any of that? <laughs> we might have a few. There were. Uh, let me just scroll. First of all, thank you. <laughs> that was You're so very beautiful welcome. Thank and you. wild and. Uh, you can see how enthusiastic you are about <laughs> um, the work that you digest as well as uh, create. And um, that's really cool. I don't feel, I, I feel like a 
creators, it's easy to talk about the work we make and uh, harder to talk about why we love what we love and how that's influencing our work. And you're like really tuned into that. So that was like, so thrilling. Very cool. Unsurprisingly, Chris has a question. I'm so excited <laughs> Chris is here with all the merch. Thanks for holding it up. That's great. So if it's okay, uh, if anyone has a question after Chris, you can just use the raise hand thing or just like, ah, if, if you're not into computers <laughs> like Chris is. And I'm going to spotlight um, Chris so we can hear and see him. Hey, Chris. Hey, hey, thanks. Um, my question is really simple. What, you mentioned that you go from thumbnail straight to inks. No, and... no, no, I pencil too. Oh, okay, okay. I think I just left that out. Okay, and I was curious <laughs> about like you, your research process. So if you're going to start in the morning with writing something, mm -hmm. what kind of research do you do? Do you read books or do you, like, what does that look like? So like the research thing is something that sort of happens um, a lot of the time right before bed. Um, I like reading a lot of uh, primary source historical things. Like right now I am reading... Um, a 16th century Spanish text um, that is called Repudiation of Superstition and All Forms of Witchcraft. Um, it's a lengthy title, uh, and like it has a lot to do with this other book of like it's it's sort of like a, it's like a witch fighting witch finding type manual kind of thing, but it's a lot drier uh, than like the Malaeus Maleficarum. Uh, but it does have specific. It is one of the only like translated texts that are available to me uh that has mention of the saludadores who are the the topic of um of tendrils for the divine um so like the there are there are tales of cunning men and of um faith healers and things like that just all over europe I'm, I promise you I'm coming back to your question. Um, <laughs> but like the saludadores have particular powers and are associated with very particular things, right? Like the um the like the the association with rabies and with uh, treating livestock in particular is something that is uh, kind of endemic to the Iberian Peninsula. Like it sort of started down in Portugal and sort of fused with the myth complex of the saludador in uh, in España and like a little bit before the events of this story. Um, yeah, so like I'll I'll be reading this stuff and then the way that this tends to go for me is that I'll read one thing um and be like oh that's interesting and i'll like put a little uh one of those little flags you know those like post-it flags onto it and then sort of jump off from there and then if i can find a jstor thing one of the main reasons that i keep my academic jobs um is that i get access to jstor jstor rules dudes um <laughs> so i'll just like i'll jump off uh from that and um and so, like, look up, look for articles on JSTOR. Um, sometimes I'll send them with my wife to go and print while she's at work. Uh, so I can take, so I can, so when she brings them back, I can highlight them and just sort of like put little, little notes and draw little pictures of the margins and that kind of thing. Um, and then, so yeah, like all of that, I try to front load that as much as possible. So, like, I'll, I, I held off on writing um, the Saludador story uh, until I could get access to the, um, uh, this access access to some articles that I needed to do. And that, like, it took, like, a year because uh, I just didn't know very many other academics, you know? Um, and I didn't, like, <laughs> nobody at Leslie was able to tell me. So I teach at, I teach at Leslie in their low residency uh, MFA program, and none of the other profs there were able to tell me that I had JSTOR access. Um, and then I started teaching at University of Tulsa, which does have JSTOR access, but then, like, I also found out that Leslie has it, too. So, whatever. Um, Anyway, point is, uh, I eventually got access to uh, access to JSTOR so I could sort of like reaffirm some of the things that I thought I had learned from this offhand mention of this particular myth complex in this one book, which I don't even remember what it was. Uh, so it's sort of like, and then like half of the research that I do, I just disregard anyway. Um, I, I may just do this to make myself feel crazy. Uh, and to put off doing doing the actual work like I, I have spent like a double digit number of hours looking up um looking for reference on uh folding chairs in the middle ages 
uh, which were totally a thing. They came uh, along with the Moorish invasion of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, Krista, not necessarily. Um, a lot of uh, like libraries um, have JSTOR access. You may just have to go through a librarian uh, in order to find that out. Um, yeah, so you, just, you you'll be able to you'll be able to work it. And a lot of libraries also have subscriptions to like newspapers and things like that. So if you have a library card, you can probably get access to your local paper, the New York Times, um, without having to pay for it. Libraries are truly amazing things, and there's no possible way they would be established today. Um, so yeah, look into that. Ask your ask your local librarian if there are any particular articles that you need access to you can just, just email your man and uh we'll work something out um <clears throat> so yeah like a lot of there's a lot of like it's a it's a very disorganized process is basically what i'm saying um it's not like i don't go most of the time with an idea that i need i need to find out this specific piece of information it's more like i need to find out general things about anchoresses or I need to find out general things about miasma theory, leprosy, um, the way leper colonies were organized, this particular rebellion against lepers in 1325, which resulted in uh, like between 80 and 150 of them being burnt at the stake by the Catholic Church. Um, <coughs> the whatever it is like folding chairs, you know, it's just like you like you leave the information where it wants you to go or the information leads you where it wants you to go uh and then you sort of like roll it around for a little while uh and then and then maybe you come up with an idea for a story or maybe maybe you don't it's really no way to know and you're not you're not any worse off for having done the research does that actually answer the question or did i just sort of dance yeah around no that's it? perfect that thanks thanks a lot that's great yeah no problem man. it's my pleasure Awesome. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, we have, uh, Judith would like to ask a question as well. Hi. Hi, uh, I, I came 15 minutes late. So if I ask a question that you answered, I apologize. I'm interested in everything that you're saying that seems to be on the scale of between religion and superstition and everything in between. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't hear where you grew up or what you, what, um, context you were, were you raised in a religious home or anything like that or? Not really. Um, we I, I was born outside of Philly. Uh, we moved down to Texas when I was about twelve or so. Uh, grew up, I finished growing up in this town called Denton, um, which is just a little bit north of Dallas, like forty five minutes north of there. So this is like this is some Bible Belt mm -hmm. area, um, which you know, fine. I didn't really have a whole lot of dealings with it. You know, like I went to a couple of Sunday school things when I was a kid, and then I was like, this is. This is not for me. Um, <clears throat> and so, I don't know, over time I sort of grew, <laughs> but I went through like a, I went through my teens, right? And became very like militantly anti-religion of any description. Uh, because that's what you do when you're a teen of a particular stripe. You wear a lot of black, which, okay, fine. But you wear, you wear a lot of black and then you become suspicious of religion. Uh, and then either you move out of those phases or you move out of them and then you like you left some stuff behind so you have to come back to pick that stuff up and you're like oh why did i move out of here again mm. um i don't personally have any kind of like uh any kind of solid religious belief um it apparently interests you oh it's fascinating yeah, yeah. absolutely like so, so much I, of um so yeah. much of our of our history of western society has been based around the actions of the catholic church and the interactions of the catholic church with islam judaism uh and then other religions as it as it as it went on um it, it, it seems <laughs> it's weird to me when people are not interested in it i guess so i have a question to ask you about something you were saying something about not wanting to use so much not liking the, the technology or the analog thing and I thought I detected a bit of an apology there, and it surprised me for you to be apologetic about it. First of all, you clearly are doing fine with your process, but <laughs> thank you. I don't know. Are you familiar with Ta Ralph Town Townsend and uh, Ralph Towner and uh, a group called Organ? So they're mm -hmm. fabulous, and they make all their instruments, Ooh. and they're not electrical. 
And it seems to me that the whole computer technology thing, which I was born before, like I went to USC for animation before they used computers. Mm -hmm. um, my son, however, knew computers by the time he was eight. And mm -hmm. in the 80s, he said to me, mom, if you're gonna be a graphic designer, you have to have a Macintosh. And so I kind of knew how to do that. But I mm -hmm. still see that people don't necessarily like, um, they wanna have their hands in the thing. Yeah, and exactly. From everything you told me, because I wasn't familiar with your work, you're into the music and the sound and the and the material. It's like you're a full, you're a full, full service sensual artist, right? <laughs> Everyone said the senses is happening. And I, I guess I'm just wanting to encourage anyone who's listening to you and you not to be apologetic about how you work and also to to just the technology is obviously great if it's great, but we all know that it has its downside too. I mean, while I'm talking, while you're talking, I could look up 20 things and I love that I can do that. Mm -hmm. But the art itself, you know, I'm still like old fashioned enough. So uh, Walter Benjamin's talking about the aura of the hand of the artist. If they, we don't want that to be lost. He wrote an article in 1936 called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Oh, and, I, did, I had to read that for school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very important thing, and it's still very relevant now that photography makes the truth not believable. You know, you can't use photography for forensics anymore or mm -hmm. the whole AI thing of what's real and what's not real, which actually humans were always wondering about what's real and what's not real. So it's kind of just coming around. Anyway, it's not exactly a question, but I really enjoyed hearing you describe your process. And, oh, and you gave us a million things to look up. <laughs> yeah hopefully i spelled like a quarter of it correctly and i'm I was really happy when uh carl had a slide with like uh there was a word on there but it was also in some like gorgeous font and i was like oh i still don't know how to spell that <laughs> it was so great. what was the word how many languages do you know one last question uh like well well english um but i like the tip of your tongue I've done some, um, I've done, <laughs> I did Duolingo Spanish. I took Latin when I was in high school. Uh, and so most of that's totally gone. Um, I took German when I was in college. A lot of that's gone too. Um, and I also took Farsi when I was in college. Uh, and that's, that's totally gone, except for like one quote, quote from Hafiz, uh, which is, uh, I think my pronunciation is probably really bad. But that's that means I would like to bury the memories that I have of you with my body, uh, which is a lot. It seems a lot nicer um, in Persian. Like Hafiz is like the the ancient Persian poet. He's like the guy. Like there's a sort of fortune telling game around Persian New Year where like they'll pull out this big book of Hafiz, um, uh, and like open it to a random page and you read the poem out loud and you're like, oh this is this this is what it says to me for this year i want to bury i want to bury the memories that i have of you with my body it sounds like a good thing to know how to say it might come in handy sometimes oh yeah totally and i mean like my solo work is open casket sound system like it's just like really in that <laughs> in that range so thank you you're welcome thank you for asking such a good question Awesome. I'm going to go to gallery view to see if I can see everybody. So it's just a, a little bit mighty group. Anybody have other questions? You can throw it in the chat or get on the mic and make some noise. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid. Carl makes weird noises all the time. So yeah, it's kind of, kind of like what I would rather be doing most of the time <laughs> right now. I'm like really happy to be talking to you guys though. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. That's very oh, sweet yeah, of Mar you. Maria, were you going to add something? Maria was just giving a shout in the chat, some compliments. Oh, uh, I I was just thinking, uh, you know, your work is so vivid, like it it makes me feel like, uh, you know, you you are traveling to these places to do your work almost, but you're basically oh God, just I doing wish. research. <laughs> yeah, um, but it we did feels go... like you're in those places, like you're in Spain or you're in Portugal. Or... <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so we did go to Spain. Um for our honeymoon back in 2015 uh we sort of like went down the eastern coast and then in towards um 
Cordoba, I think, was the most inland we got. And then we went from Cordoba down to Malaga. Um, and, like, I don't know. Like, we took a lot of pictures, as one might expect, you know, as you do. But they're mostly in the city. And, like, these old cities... Um, a few years before that, we were in Istanbul, right? And Istanbul is one of the oldest cities on the planet, right? And, like... You go into Istanbul and you can see that there is a building here that was built like maybe the 1500s and there's a cell phone store in it. They're like, <laughs> they're like hawking Motorola's out of the bottom of this, uh, uh, of, of this, of this building that was like built before our grandfather's 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 were even like beginning to gestate. It's such a it's such a bizarre thing that like modernity just sort of like continues to grow over stuff. Um, all of what you just say, thank you so much for that. <laughs> I like I do a lot of photo research, um, and I wish that I had the budget and the time to travel more so I could just do more firsthand stuff. But there we go. We need to get Carl a travel grant ASAP. Yeah, somebody like <laughs> I've had a really good uh, really good record with uh, writing grants uh, over the course of the past. 24 six years or so um like that one in 2018 that i told you all about that i used to do the boys kiss show was the first grant i'd ever applied for um and there were like two grants that i applied for with that um and then the telsa artist fellowship is technically a grant thing that i had to apply for after a year living here maybe i will yeah judith would love to host you in jerusalem all right um I'm just I'm just outside of Boston and uh, Carl is here uh, during the summer for the low res MFA so it's like mm -hmm. less exotic I'd be like uh, why do you yeah. vulgar are you still <laughs> here? I did live in I lived in Vermont for like five years too so like I, I feel like I've done New England yeah you is there is there a place just riffing on that uh is there a place that you haven't lived that the landscape is sort of calling to you that you'd like to visit or live um, I want to go to Malta. Um, I think everybody wants to go to Malta. Um, I'm sorry, I'm answer, answering a question in the chat here. Um, I know, I have like one eye on it too. Can you say the question out loud? Um, I keep thinking of Remains to be Seen, genius title, <laughs> which I thought of it myself. So I thought of that title before I realized it was going to be on the uh, on the record. Or on the album and it's like it's mostly live tracks uh which i feel it's like there's layers there and it's like a it's like an onion i felt very proud of myself when that came out um so the name of this book that i was talking about is pedro ciruelo's um uh repudiation of all forms of uh, which Crafts and superstition. Um, it is dry as hell. Um, if you are looking for a more interesting read uh, about a similar topic, um, I am going to drop another one. Uh, this is Heinrich uh, Springer. Uh, and there's another author on this too. And some other dude. Okay. I love Google. <laughs> Team Google. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the Malayas Maleficarum. Uh, and the Malayas Maleficarum has multiple other, um, multiple translations and multiple like editions of it. The... The repudiation of all forms of witchcraft and superstition was, to my knowledge, only published in English maybe twice. Uh, and the translation is... Um, again, I, I like don't know if I, if I should do this, but Krista is interested in witches. I'm asking <laughs> them as like a big fan. And you were getting like church nods from Krista about mm -hmm, the translation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Sorry, I just had to jump in. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm currently doing my final assignment for the year long project at SAW. Mm. Um, and I started this off with Jess in her nonfiction class. And um, 
this is uh, one of my obsessions these days um, on Johannes Kepler and yeah. his, his mother who was tried as a witch. And so I'm reading everything and I have read the Malleus <laughs> Maleficarum, um, which was something. But, it sure uh, is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I've got, I was reading a, um, I brought this with me to Spain. Like that's the last time I was like really cracked open the Malaya's Maleficarum five or six years ago at this point. Um, I brought it with me to Spain and I was like highlighting things while we were on a train going from uh, Barcelona up to um, Montserrat. And it's like, why am I, why am I doing this? I, I'm, this, this, I'm working right now. I'm on my honeymoon. I don't need to be doing this. I should be looking out the window or at my new wife uh, and like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like you don't really get to turn it off it just happens when it happens right um yeah and then i think i ran into the ciruelo book at in some other context i may have been a jstor article that i like that quoted him in it um uh troy asked uh where i learned to calligraph and that's on the internet baby um <laughs> that's like uh, I was I was in between doing um, the pestle and the next thing in that series until the blood runs black, and I was like, I don't I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to write black letter gothic. I should probably sort that out. Uh, and so I spent like two or three months just writing lie Ill illy uh, with a chisel tip uh, with a chisel tip um, um, uh, uh, felt tip marker, um, and the. Uh, and so that's been one of the best like stage tricks that I've ever learned for conventions. So like now, especially with um with the pestle where that was like hand bound and hand calligraphed on every single cover, I would like do this intricate sort of like ritual thing where I would like write people's name. I would in inscribe the book on the interior of the front cover and like draw little doodlies around it in this gold pen. Um, and yeah, it's a great it's a great stage trick. If you know how to do that, or if you uh, can teach yourself how to do that, uh, highly recommended. It adds a real value added. Awesome. There are a couple more things in the chat, just like people being like, "Oh, did you read this?" And there's this other book that's amazing. So you have a lot of uh, fans uh, of, of <laughs> the work, but also the uh, you could just have like a, a monthly uh, gathering of of uh, like Jay stories that would be well attended. I think. <laughs> If you don't already, <laughs> there is the uh, I mean, there's that monthly gathering of uh, of musicians, but like that's a different a different tip. Um, I do like all the design and uh, lettering for that, but it's that's a that's a that's a computery thing, and really a lot of the time my heart's not in that. I just gotta <laughs> I just know I gotta bang it out and get it done. <laughs> um, Troy also asked if I was a self taught musician. Really calling me a musician is very generous. Um, like I, what I'm doing is more, more in the noise genre. Um, like if you, uh, shoot, I should probably pull this up. Um, I'm dropping a link in the chat here. Yeah, Maria. It rules. Um, so there's the there's the band camp. You can hear some of what I'm doing. It does have like a little bit of DNA in common with like dub, like dub reggae. Is that's that was really my goal to do uh to do like extremely slow, extremely heavy dub. Um but it mutated the more uh <laughs> the more I was doing it and now um just adding the sound system on the end of the name feels like it doesn't doesn't really fit anymore. Um, so I don't know anything about like notes or theory <laughs> or how to do the same thing more than once. Um, and that's like that's the thing that's vital about this for me. Like the when you're doing comics, you have to beat a page of comics to death at least five times. Uh, and then when you're doing comics for the stage, that adds like a sixth, seventh, and then however, however many times you rehearse that afterwards. Uh, um, so like you end up beating, you end up spending too much time with this page, you know, and it become, it can, it can, and has done for me, um, suck a lot of the life out of the process. Uh, 
but like with music it's or with the way that i do music it's very immediate um like i so the one of the albums that's on that open casket sound system Bandcamp, uh the one called living wake i think is what i named it yeah the most recent one on there uh that's the first time i ever planned anything out um like i loaded up some samples into uh into that 404 that i was using to do the do the recorded sounds for uh live performances and things like that um and i don't know there's a, a section that there was uh <laughs> there's like a, a sample from this uh 90s video game called altered beast where it goes rise from your grave uh like towards the beginning of that um and i included that because i thought it was funny uh, and then there's a section in the middle, uh, which is called Bury Me Big Truck, um, which is samples from a dump truck uh, dropping off like a ton of river stones at my house um, and then sort of like cut up and then manipulated into making rhythms and uh, into distorted into tones and that kind of thing. Um, again, all of that was like, again, it's like it's a live, largely improvised set, but like I had written out sections that I was going to do things with. And that's, I don't want to keep doing that <laughs> for these sort of things. I want to keep it like as improvisational as possible. Uh, but I also, I play in like two or three other bands and sometimes you need to have a structure uh, to work with other people. Yay. Uh, I, I, I was paraphrasing what Carl said. Would like to improv, but good to have a set list. And I, I was just thinking about outlining comics and thinking oh that's kind of like a set list if you're someone who's afraid of an outline or afraid of structure if you're like it's just a set list man what a jam yeah, man. you didn't really have to play this certain sounds you want to listen to uh so it's, <laughs> it's sort of like a wish list too and i, I yeah. love making a wish list of all this stuff <laughs> so yeah like a list is really sort of magical uh and then or a recipe even that you can veer from but you, no matter how many times i've cooked the same thing if I if I encountered that recipe the first time via a written recipe, I always have to like go look in the spell book for the cornbread recipe, even mm -hmm. if it's like halfway memorized. I'm like, oh yeah, but it, I I just want to I just want to look at it. I need, I need to make it. sure. I need to make sure. <laughs> yeah, there's something. Like, about what, that. one of the things that I do when like if I get stuck while I'm writing something is that I'll um until I save the cat that uh yeah that it's a it's a screenwriting thing. Uh, where this guy, Blake Snyder, had done the incredibly depressing and disheartening work of breaking down uh, tentpole 90-minute uh, motion pictures into a list of, like, 25 or 30 beats, uh, and then assigning, like, specific down-to-the-second um, times where these appear in each in each film. Uh, the main one that he uses for this is Star Wars, and that's the that's the one that I always refer to when I'm like teaching this idea to people. Um, but like, you start you you read this book, and then you, you like identify all of these beats or whatever, and you watch a movie, and you're like, oh oh no, oh no, um, <laughs> and like it'll ruin movies for you for like three months. But it builds this better understanding of it, better understanding of the way these like very formulaic tentpole pictures are are structured and like the more into the age of people going to school for film writing degrees uh we get the more you're going to see this and more you're the more you're going to see people sort of challenging it and then winning academy awards for doing something slightly different um but the um so like i have a printout of that and my man tim stout uh who was another graduate of the center for cartoon studies um did this thing where he was running workshops where he was using the save the cat workshop uh, worksheet uh, to like break down a 110 page graphic novel right so like each one of these each one of these moments in the save the cat process was um like a spread it's like two facing pages man um and so like this is where this happens this is where this happens this is where this happens and so you have these specific beats uh, that you're trying to hit on every other page uh, and like, I don't know, I, I tend to prevaricate and to, to wool gather and to get into the weeds. Um, and I like to use words like prevaricate. So like, you know, I'll, I'll get lost in things if I'm not paying clo super close attention. Um, but like having a structure like that being like, okay, so this, this is where I'm at. I had forgotten what I was supposed to be doing, but I know that this is what needs to happen here. I will use that. Uh, and then sort of move on from there and do whatever I want. 
uh, for the rest of it. Um, the trick with using those sort of structural, um, those structural crutches um, is that you don't write to them, you write with them. Um, like they're again, like name name a Marvel movie. Like they're all basically the same structure, and like there there is a playbook. I don't I don't think it's public as yet, but like there is a playbook that that is circulated around these writers' rooms, saying what needs to happen when, like when the heartbreaking thing about the main character's dad is going to happen, um, like when there's going to be sort of a queer baiting joke, uh, and then when um uh then then when when the first punch happens like this it there's gotta be because it's all it's all so formulaic and it's all so uh based on this um but again that that's writing that's writing to a form rather than with one uh and again like i don't actually have any particular beef with marvel movies um they're not for me but i think people there are a lot of people who get a lot out of them like my little brother is just a big fan good for him it's good like I think if something's deeply mystifying to see like oh there there could be a recipe and I could use this that feels like a little uh comforting so mm -hmm. I'm glad that they exist but I, I also like learn learning a thing and then like not listening to it mm -hmm. I was a terrible student I was always like not doing what I was supposed to do <laughs> in art classes specifically because I just thought I knew more than the teacher I was like inseparable and now I'm yeah, teaching same. and getting what I uh, deserve <laughs> but uh but yeah I'm glad that you mentioned writing as a process in in relation to uh, the research you're doing and how loose or how tight you're holding on to those things like the things that you research you're like yeah I, I might retain or use half of it yeah. and then like 10 years later at 2 a.m you're like wait when wasn't there a what was that, what was that yeah yeah oh mm -hmm. wait a minute let me go back to my weird notes um so that was really cool to see those slides and to see your process so right. um does anybody else have any questions? If not, I think we're like close to the end of our call. It's been so thrilling having Carl Antonowitz here. Did I say it right? Yeah, that's correct. From memory that time, I didn't look at my recipe. Hey, nice. <laughs> so uh, now that you're a household name <laughs> on the song <laughs> profile, so cool to, uh, to see your I did. I was, uh, I was hanging out in the saw, uh, in the school for about a, a month and a half. <laughs> a oh, yeah, of years yeah, ago. yeah, yeah, yeah. You were um, an anchor s of saw I guess. yeah that was pretty much it i didn't really see a whole lot of people <laughs> yeah um do we have anybody who's in gainesville in the chat right now is anyone irl gainesville i don't think so not on the call but we had a few people come in and out so that might have been true at some point i i was briefly in gainesville um in 2016 but mm. just i don't know what i was doing i was having a great time at saw <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I I had such a good time in Gainesville. Like there's so the thing, um, there's an event there called Squared Wave, which didn't was it wasn't extant at the time that you were there, Jess, but this it's this like weirdo open mic night that happens once monthly on the second Wednesday of the month, um, at this place called Satch Squared. Um, and so I, I got a chance to play there because like a couple of the friends that I made in 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 Gainesville had like, I don't know, a wash tub and a couple of contact mics and a looper pedal. Um so I just did like a like a five or ten minute set there um the month that I was there and like that's on remains to be seen. One. Two, um <laughs> like I just I just stole the idea. Um and that's that's the reason that that one ox exists at all. Nice. So we love a residency. Well, I hope you get a travel grant soon. Yeah, I should, I should go ahead and apply for one, huh? <laughs> go somewhere, do it. Well, I'll, I'll, you need a letter of reference or something. <laughs> I don't know what we could do. With sure it. thing. Sure. Are there any that you recommend applying to? Um, I don't know. There, uh, the only one I know of that was recently announced uh, in the Saw Network. There's one in Australia um, mm. that's like specifically for cartoonists. Um, but if I, I don't know. I always look on nyfa.org. It's like really basic, but that's usually where okay. I look for residencies. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know writing residencies like McDowell and Yaddo. I, I, I might be spelling. Yeah, I and mean, you could probably like, you can sell doing comics as a um, as a writing practice as much as for uh, sure. Yeah, um, one of my that's, old that's how we have mates, that. Uh, um, go ahead. Yeah, I mean it's kind of a niche, so in some ways it sets you apart from other applicants if you're going to something that's specifically writing based. I mm -hmm. haven't had a lot of luck with it. I've only been to one residency, but. 
um, I, I do know a cartoonist, Dean Haspiel, who was a Yado fellow. Love that I want to say like in the mid 20 teens or maybe early 2010s mm -hmm. um, and said he had a good time. And usually at, at the nicer writing residencies, they like make you lunch and <laughs> you have a private area and you meet a lot of yeah, and then, like, you could people. Go yeah. and like hang out and smoke cigarettes with Cormac McCarthy or whatever. Yeah. And, like, <laughs> be like, wait a minute. Do I know you from like the New York Times or something? Yeah. So the next uh, time we see you, you have a, a, a slew of new adventures to tell us. We can't wait to see you again. <laughs> I'm happy to come and talk to you guys anytime. Uh, like I said, there's very few things that I like better than talking to people. So yay. Where can we, so you put your links in there and I can uh, put them one more time uh, in the chat if you're on the live call right now. And hopefully we'll add them to the YouTube as well. But are you tabling? You said you're tabling this year in the fall. Do you want to tell us? Yeah, about I'll be doing, I'm definitely doing SPX. Um, I'm debating whether I'm going to do cake. Um, I had a really good time at cake last year. That's actually where Field Mouse Press picked up my book. But um, I... I had to I had to drop like a thousand dollars on uh, on plane tickets last week. So like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's hard it's hard to do it more than once. And the nice thing about being in Tulsa is you're not that far away. But the downside is like, everything costs money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Um, awesome. Okay, well, uh, we won't take up too much more of your time. Thanks for being here. A round of applause, either unmuted or muted. <laughs> Everyone's clapping. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you so much for coming and listening to me uh, jaw at you. Um, if there are any other questions that you have, just email me at cantocomics at gmail.com. Uh, and you have to and sing it when you type it in. <laughs> I will be, um, I, I, I'll get back at you. Uh, April is going to be awful, um, but. <laughs> Seven to 10 business days. Carl will write you back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Give me, give me a week or so. Okay. That sounds great. Thanks, Carl. It's great to, to see you, to hear about your work. Yeah, likewise, guys. Great to meet all of you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining us. This has been a production of the Sequential Artists Workshop, or SAW. You can find us on social media at Comics Workshop and online at sawcomics.org. You can hear about our many courses at learn.sawcomics.org. SAW is a nonprofit and supported by people like you. Learn how to make a tax-deductible donation at the donate page of sawcomics.org. You can join our free community of comics explorers at members.sawcomics.org. Thanks so much for being here.